All right, today we are going to consider bones in terms of a case study as if you were a forensic anthropologist. So as a note, I am not a forensic anthropologist. So this case study is not really based on what a true forensic anthropologist would do, but it does use the biological concepts of a skeletal system to walk you through some of the basics. So essentially, don't hold me to any of this, but do learn the biology that goes along with it. As your forensic investigator, you begin a skeleton to examine. You know nothing about the body so far, so you begin to examine the body. First thing you try to determine the age of the person. And if you read about this, you'll find that there are lots of different ways to determine the age of the person. But all we care about is that we can examine long bones to tell that they are an adult and not a child. So from a biology perspective, how do we know the difference between being an adult and a child based on your bones? Well, main difference between being an adult and a child in general is essentially that adults have stopped growing. And most of that comes in in the bones. So how would we know that? Well, our bones would have stopped growing. So there has to be some way to tell that bones are either growing or not growing. I mentioned this in a previous video, but bones themselves cannot grow once they've mineralized. They have to have cartilage in them to make that happen. So what do we have? Well, if we have a bone, which you can see we do, is made out of a variety of different things. There's a lot of different parts to this bone. Some of them are important, some of them are not. In this particular case, you can see this is the humerus or the arm bone. But the key thing I care about right now is the growth plate of the bone. Why do I care about the growth plate? Because that's the cartilage section of the bone that is still growing. So it's essentially a piece of cartilage in the bone that bits can be added to. It's really interesting because this cartilage actually pushes down as it goes. So for instance, if what you have is bone, bone, and in between that, a growth plate of cartilage. So here's our growth plate of cartilage. The bone itself can't grow, but the cartilage can. So when the cartilage grows, it's going to go ahead and it's going to push down that bit of bone. So it's going to get lower down, except that this bit of cartilage here will then go ahead and mineralize and turn into bone. So the growth plate doesn't necessarily get, like you don't get more cartilage as you go. You grow some cartilage and then it becomes mineralized and that just keeps going until the bone gets as long as it's supposed to get and then it stops growing. So if you have cartilage growth plates, child, when you are an adult, they fully mineralize and kaboom, you don't have them anymore. All right, so that's one thing. Let's see what's next. Continuing to examine, you discover this person had broken both their arm and their leg. So we're gonna talk about what happens when you break a bone and what it does to improve upon that. So it talks first about how the leg break was recent. All right, so we've said that bones are actually very active because they have blood vessels running through them to provide nutrients to the active cells. So if you break a bone, you know what else you're going to break along with it? Blood vessels. So actually the very first thing that happens when you break a bone is you break a whole bunch of blood vessels as well. Sure, you've broken mineralized bits of bone, but you also need to first start by clotting the blood and closing up those blood vessels. Now because this is a much larger, more complex process, it is given a larger name and is often called a hematoma. So a hematoma would be the great big blood clot that occurs when you break a bone and you've busted a bunch of those blood vessels and they need to clot all up. So that's the first thing that happens. And this clot is pretty sticky and it helps hold the bone pieces together. And it's hanging on using the same stuff you use in regular blood clotting like fibrin and platelets. So that's the hematoma. That is the very first thing. If you have not had any time to really heal, what you'll have is a blood clot. Then the bone actually begins to heal and it does that by replacing the blood clot with stuff that's actually going to become bone. Well, what's the stuff that becomes bone? Cartilage becomes bone. So we need to replace the hematoma with the necessary proteins produced by the cartilage. We do that by adding, so we wanna be building cartilage, and we build cartilage with 
chondroblasts. So early on, we might also find chondroblasts. By the way, as we're in the hematoma and early building stages, you might also find fibroblasts because they are going to take part in helping to put back together some of the fibrous pieces as well. So fibroblasts and chondroblasts will both activate and that is the early stage of bone. In this case, it noted that they had two breaks. One was older, one was younger. So this would be the early one. So then what happens? Well, now that we have a built base of cartilage, what do we want to do to it? Well, we want to add bone to it. How do we add bone to it? We add bone, which is minerals, using osteoblasts. The osteoblasts build the bone just like they do in your regular bones, and they will build back bone. Do they build back only as much bone as you had before? Well, if you let a bone heal well and heal properly, your body actually tends to overcompensate for this, and it will actually add extra minerals to the area in which you have put pressure on by breaking and injured, and it will form what is called a callus. Typically, that callus can actually be seen long after the injury is gone, so people can tell they've had broken bones many, many, many years after that they are done, so you can see every break you've ever had pretty much on an x-ray because they'll all have calluses. All right, so next up. There's some slight curves in the bones that make you think this person may have carried something heavy over their right shoulder. Okay, so now this, this is gonna relate directly to how the bone is formed and how it does what we call remodeling, meaning that something causes it to change. So first of all, for this one, you get my crappy drawing of a bone. At least it kind of looks like a bone, right? All right. And what we're talking about is putting some kind of pressure on just one side of it. So here's an arrow. Let's put pressure on this side of the bone. If we put pressure on this side of the bone, what are we going to do? Well, pressure activates osteoblasts. So just like injury activates osteoblasts, so does pressure. Your body says, oh man, I'm doing something. I need more there. And it will tell the osteoblasts to be more active. And what they will do is they will try to add stuff to the bone. So you'll get actual added bone on the side with the pressure. Okay, so what's gonna happen to the other side that doesn't have the pressure? Well, as you would imagine, if it doesn't have pressure, it's not gonna have an impetus to continue to grow. And the osteoclasts might get activated and they will actually take away bits of the bone. So even though my drawings aren't super great, what essentially ends up happening is you end up with a bone that's got more stuff on that side. This is dramatically over exaggerated. And maybe less stuff on this side and it bends the bone, which is why you should not hold things that throw you off balance all the time because your bones really do react to that. So try to keep your backpack on both straps and keep everything as balanced as you can. But osteoblasts will grow more on the pressure side. Osteoclasts will remove mineral on the other side. Determine your skeleton belongs to a woman. How did you know this? Well, from a sex and hormone and all of that perspective, most skeletons can be gendered. Now, of course, this is along a continuum, so things are never exactly perfect. We sort of have arbitrary cutoffs in which we say, well, it's likely based on development of men and women based on their hormones and things that this is how they came out. But it's always kind of a little bit of a game. So there's a couple different ones. You're probably familiar with the pelvis. That is actually the main way. Women have a pelvis that has a much wider angle. Men have a pelvis with a smaller angle because women's pelvises are made to put babies through. The other places that you might not be familiar with involve the head. So the jaw in women is typically a little bit more pointed and has a little bit of a wider angle. The jaw in men is typically more wide, square, and ends up like that. So let me do a quick drawing difference between a male and a female jaw. So a female jaw might come out like that. A male jaw might come out like this. Those are my crappy drawings of jaws. 
The other spots that are just slightly different are actually in the skull. Sometimes there's a difference in skull size, but again, you can have small men and larger women, so it's a little hard to gauge that precisely. But in the very, very, very back of the skull, where it kind of comes in underneath, men have a larger, what is called mastoid process. So you can actually feel a bump kind of in there, and women have a smaller one. So those are three different bones. Your uh, sipital bone, your mandible, and your pelvic bones. So in fact, the likelihood is your skeleton belongs to an older woman, which we determine because the bones appear spongy. What could cause that and what would be common in older women that would cause spongy bones? Well, you might be familiar with a disease called osteoporosis. Which quite literally, if you break it down to Latin, means bone holes, holes in the bones. And what would holes in the bones look like? Well, it very literally looks like holes in the bones. See this? This is what a bone is supposed to look like, nice and tight and lots of mineral tissue. This is what a bone with osteoporosis looks like. And as you can imagine, that's an inherent problem because then it does not provide the structure and protection that are needed. So what cells would make that appearance and how would they do that? So here we are back to our same sets of cells. In this case, we are removing minerals. So removing minerals is typically the action of osteoclasts. They are the mineral removers. So in this case, we have an overproduction of osteoclasts with an underactivity of osteoblasts. They actually think the underactivity seems to be more of the problem as osteoblasts are activated by a variety of things pressure, stuff like that, but also estrogen. So when estrogens decrease in older women, sometimes the osteoclast activity is now overpowering and it causes osteoporosis. Okay, so that is clear from all of this osteoporosis and other stuff, the woman did not intake enough calcium during her life. Now, be real, this is probably not something you could actually tell from the bones, but it does mean we get to talk about calcium, which is important because calcium is one of those things that you want to control at a constant level at all times. <gasps> Therefore, you get to make a negative feedback loop. So, first of all, the thing that we are controlling is, of course, the calcium. I mean, right? You need calcium, but where? Where do we want to control the levels of calcium? I've already mentioned that with bones, minerals actually go up and down. They can decrease, they can increase. So what's the point of maintaining a particular level? It is the level in the bloodstream. Calcium in the bloodstream is the thing your body is trying to maintain. That is because calcium is needed for so many different processes. It is needed for nerves, it is needed for muscles, it is needed pretty much just to keep everything where it's supposed to be. So calcium in your bloodstream is the main thing your body cares about. So therefore, if you don't eat enough calcium, things are going to happen. So let's consider this negative feedback loop. We have our sensor, our control center, and our effector, which will then fix the problem. Our sensor is not that important. It is an osmotic sensor, essentially, in the blood. The blood can tell there's not enough calcium because of osmosis, too much water trying to rush in and out. Okay, so where's this go? What is the gland that is actually involved in controlling calcium? It is a gland found whoop, right up here by your throat, and it is called the parathyroid gland. It is actually right next to the thyroid gland, thus parathyroid gland. And the parathyroid gland produces this thing called parathyroid hormone, which we call PTH, parathyroid hormone. I know it's very biology to name it that because it's very, very simple. And PTH gets into the body. It goes out into the bloodstream. It goes to the bones and it says, hey, we need calcium. Calcium is low. And what are your bones going to do if calcium is low? Well, unfortunately, what they're going to do is they're going to give up some of their calcium to the bloodstream, which means you are activating the osteoclasts, which will dissolve the bone. 
and this is generally what happens when you have low blood calcium. <coughs> what about if you have high blood calcium? Like what if you are crazy and you eat all the dairy and all the stuff and you just have so much calcium in your blood, you're good, you just don't need any extra. As an adult, you actually just peel that calcium out. You only need the calcium that you need at any given point in time and any extra calcium will be excreted from the body. And if you happen to have the wrong sorts of genetics, it might also get caught in the kidneys and give you kidney stones. That's not for everybody though. Only some people have that problem. So calcium is not super useful to you as an adult. However, as a child, the whole point, of course, is to build more bone with more calcium. So guess what? As a kid, there's actually another whole section of this loop. So I'm just going to throw it in here, which is the high section of the loop, but only active in children. This one comes from the thyroid gland. So if you have extra calcium as a child, you have high the thyroid gland produces a hormone called calcitonin which activates osteoblasts, which builds bone. So this is why it's good to give children things with extra calcium and we think about doing that because the extra calcium does actually go to their bones pretty much no matter what because they have this lovely hormone that goes away after you are done growing and you hit puberty. <coughs> All right, so if that's true, then what can you do to help rebuild your bones? If you can't just put extra calcium on them randomly, what can you do? Well, we've already seen in the previous stuff that there are ways to get the bones to build more minerals. They typically involve things like adding pressure or injury to the bones. Now you don't wanna injure your bones and you don't wanna pressure them in bad ways, but if you can put pressure on them in nice, even ways, convince your bones that they need to work and they need to do something and you're gonna put weight on them, they will go ahead and add more minerals. Maybe not a lot, but typically enough. So what do you wanna do? Strength training of some kind. It doesn't need to be complicated. Lift some light weights, um, jump. That actually puts pressure on the lower part of the body. Running puts pressure on the body. There are lots of different things you can do. Even water aerobics put pressure on the body. And I like that one because it puts pressure on like the upper body, even when you're not trying to, because the water puts pressure on it. So there are lots and lots of different ways to put pressure on the bones, but that is what you need to do as an adult to have healthy bones. It is not about how much calcium you take. If you take a calcium supplement, you probably don't even want to take too much and you want to take it away from other foods so it doesn't mess with it. And then you want to make sure you do some kind of strength building program. All right, I'm off my soapbox. We can go on to the next thing. There's not that many left. <clears throat> All right. There are some connective tissues in the body you are examining, which is also probably not gonna happen for forensic anthropology, but again, biology, so we're faking it real good. It says you notice inflammation in the connections from the femur to the tibia and fibula. Huh, what connects the femur to the tibia and the fibula? Well, the femur is the large bone in your thigh. The tibia and the fibula are the small bones in the bottom portion of your leg, your shin. So if you are connecting a bone to a bone, it is called a ligament. What about if you're connecting a bone to a muscle? Well, that's another one. It is called a tendon. Now what happens if you inflame it? So we've talked about inflammation before. Typically when you talk about inflammation, you add itis to it, right? Tendonitis. I'm sure most people have had tendonitis at least one point in time. I have had it in the tendons of my rotator cuff. In fact, it was so bad, it tore my rotator cuff and I had to get it fixed. So ligament must be ligamentitis, right? I hate to tell you this, so that is not typically a word we use. You might find it somewhere, but it's not really a common word we use. When we inflame or injure a ligament, as long as it is not actually torn, we typically call it a sprain. It's like a sprained ankle is inflammation in the ligaments. So that's always one to remember because it's a little different from some of the other inflammation. Okay, now how about inflammation in the synovial joints, your moving joints, like your shoulders and things like that. Now we're not talking about the actual connective tissues, the ligaments or the tendons, just the joints. Well, inflammation in the joints has its own name and it is related to 
the other name of a joint, which is interesting. So joints are often called articulations. Inflammation in a joint is called arthritis. Now you know where that word comes from. It is inflammation of an articulation. So that typically means that the inflammation is coming from some other aspect of the joint, the joint membrane, the joint fluid, the cartilage in it. Um, osteoarthritis is typically a loss of cartilage. Rheumatoid arthritis is when your body actually autoimmune eats up the cartilage and causes trouble in the joints. But all of them are inflammation of joints. <clears throat> All right, and another one that is more biology than true forensic anthropology. If you want to get a sense of this one's circulatory and immune health, where would you look? Well, hey, bones make blood cells in the bone marrow. So I would look in the bone marrow. Something you might not normally see, an image of actual, still essentially alive bone marrow. So the outer part is the bone. That's the red marrow, which is where most of the blood cells and stuff are made. The yellow marrow, which has some nutrients and things like that. You can see how spongy it is. It's kind of funky looking. Sometimes you see marrow inside of cooked bones that you might buy, chicken bones and beef bones and stuff like that. Uh, if the bone dries out long enough, which is why this isn't really good for forensic anthropology, the marrow also dries out and you lose all of the sort of living material. But bone marrow is where you'd look at that. And one more kind of silly question because it's only sort of real. The final thing you're able to determine is that this woman was very obese. Why would bone density tell you something about that? Huh. So this is a might be true, might not be true kind of question. But if you can critically think your way through it, it makes sense. So why would bone density? Well, what do we know about bone density? Bone density would tell us that perhaps more osteoblasts are adding more minerals to the bone. Why would they be adding more minerals to the bone? Well, if you are obese, you are carrying around a lot of weight, you're putting a lot of pressure on your bones, and maybe your bones would get bigger and more dense. So if you ever wanted to explain that you're big boned, you now have a scientific way to do so. Although it may or may not be accurate, so just be aware of that. But as a reminder, pressure builds bones. It's really the only thing that does. All right, the last thing we're going to examine here are just kind of looking at some different joints in this big fancy multi-way Venn diagram, which are my favorite things. All right, so in this big fancy Venn diagram, we're comparing synovial joints to fibrous joints to cartilaginous joints. So what's true of all of them? Well, geez, they are all joints, which means that they are places where two or more bones meet up. Also, we call these articulations. So now you have a bunch of information that relates to joints. All right, so now we have to consider these actual different joints so we understand them all. So let's go through each one of them separately when doing a three-way Venn diagram. A lot of times I like to kind of say, well, what makes each one unique? Then what makes them similar? Fibrous joint is a joint made entirely out of fiber. And in this case, it is a joint that does not move. So made of fibers, found, in, anybody know where it's found? Mostly your skull. So the bones of the skull, it's like the parietal bones and the temporal bones, the occipital and the frontal, they all seem like one big bone. They're actually separate bones that are stuck together by fibers, but the two bones can't move once they are finished growing and fully mineralized. So a fibrous joint is where you had two separate bones, they came stuck together, and now they are essentially one big bone because they don't move at all. So bones right next to each other, no movement. A cartilaginous joint is a joint with cartilage between the bones. And nothing else. That's really sort of the key, is that cartilage between the bones means that there's a bone, there's some cartilage, and there's a bone, and that's it. And we're, so, so what's that gonna mean? Well, cartilage is squishy, but not like movable. 
So it has some movement, but it does not have like, can move in many directions. The two bones are still pretty well stuck together. Where do you find this? A couple different places. The vertebrae are a very common one. The ribs are another common one. So your ribs do need to be able to like shift, move up and down. Your back needs to be able to kind of, you know, the vertebrae need to kind of shift, but you don't want to literally be able to take one vertebrae and turn it sideways against another one. Same with the ribs. You don't want your ribs to come out at a 90 degree angle. That would be bad. So those are cartilaginous joints. That means synovial joints are joints with what between them? Well, in this case, joints with fluid between them. So it's a place where the bones aren't actually touching each other at all. They aren't even touching each other via something. They are spaced apart and they have something like a ligament or a tendon holding onto them so that they can then move, which means that they move freely. You have lots of different kinds of these. You might have hinge joints, for example, in your knee. You have ball and socket joints, for example, in your shoulder and your hip. And you even have something called a gliding joint in your wrist, which is where the bones are flat, but your wrist is still able to move around. So those are your synovial joints. All right, so now we have to figure out what makes these things similar, in some cases to each other, but different from other ones. So if we say, well, what makes a synovial joint and a cartilaginous joint similar, but different from fibrous? Well, that's pretty easy. These guys move, these guys move, these guys do not move. Any form of movement, even if it's just a little bit, is gonna make it either a synovial joint or a fibrous or a cartilaginous joint, but not a fibrous joint. All right, how about what makes a fibrous joint and a cartilaginous joint similar, but different from synovial? Well. This has cartilage between the bones. This has fibers between the bones. This has space between the bones, like some kind of fluid. So both fibrous and cartilaginous joints, bones are close together and they are actually connected directly by something. So there's something holding them together. Whereas the synovial joints, they're separated by these loose stretchy things like ligaments. And how about synovial joints? and fibrous joints and how they might be the same and different from cartilaginous joints? Yeah, no, I don't even have a good answer for that one. Call it bingo. Nothing in that spot, but the other ones there are, so you can understand how they're similar and different. And that is all the stuff you would need to answer questions about bones in this lovely, not quite case study.